John, was it just my imagination or did the singing seem extra vigorous this evening? Anyway, I really want to commend the congregation. Of course, John always does a fine job of leading the singing, but then uh, your active, uh, zealous participation is a wonderful uh, sign of encouragement. I really want to commend the congregation for the way it participates in the song service. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Well, I want to talk to you this evening about a challenging subject. Specifically, we're going to be talking about some reasons why marriages fail. But before we move into that, I just wanted to mention that uh, I haven't given out one of these new sheets in a while. And so uh, if you're a part of our group that likes to mail out cards and so forth, I call it the Barnabas and Barnabeth. Uh, mailing group. There are no dues, no meetings, no club meetings, no laws or anything like that. And what you can do is just get with me after services outside. And we have some of the best card letter sender outers. That's a new word. Best card letter sender outers in the entire world right here. And I was going to show you all, you know, some people are really creative. Here's a card uh, uh, envelope that a middle school student sent to me. Now, who wouldn't love to receive a card like that? Isn't that just beautiful? I really like that. And here's one by a collage artist, again, a homemade envelope. Now, isn't that beautiful? You know, who wouldn't enjoy receiving something like that? So if you want to participate in that, you can just get with me after services outside. If you have your Bibles and you want to follow along with our study this evening, you could be turning, first of all, to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to use Ephesians 5, 21 through 29 uh, for the foundation of our study this evening. I always tell folks before I begin a sermon on this particular topic that when I first started preaching, I think I could bring sermons on the subject of marriage or marriage and divorce or marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I think I could bring those sermons in sort of a dispassionate way. In other words, almost like an academic exercise. I could talk about the verses and explain what I thought they meant. And all of that was fine, but I want you to know that what happens over the years is as you visit with folks who are in difficult marriage circumstances, it starts to affect you more deeply and more personally. And I want you to understand that I am very conscious of the fact that probably every family here this evening is affected by these questions in one way or another in a very personal way. It would be a very unusual group that we have here tonight if every family wasn't affected by these questions in some personal way. It may be that you yourself are in difficult circumstances or have been in difficult circumstances in years gone by. Or perhaps it's a close friend or perhaps a family member. And I want you all to know that I'm very, very conscious of that. And I always pray that God will give me the wisdom to say the right things, but also to say the right things in the right way. And I understand that some of the points that we're going to talk about uh, are very emotional and uh, difficult for us to discuss. It doesn't keep me from preaching sermons on the topic, but it does cause me to preach those sermons in a different way than I would have when I was younger. So I just want you to know that I'm very aware of that. And of course, we're going to be talking about some reasons for marriage failure. And let me say that I quickly figured out that the main problem with this sermon is there could be way too many points. You could just have too many points, and it may be I'm going to leave out the main point that you thought was most important to mention, but I'm just going to try to handle this the best way that I can. And let's go ahead here and read to begin with in Ephesians 5 and verse 21, and the point I'm going to try to emphasize as we read these verses is what I think has to be one of the main reasons for marriage failure, and that is just a lack of maturity. Now, if, if we marry when we're younger, as most of us do, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we would agree that we all lacked quite a bit of maturity. We, we were all immature <laughs> whenever we married. But what I'm saying here is that to be married and to have a marriage like God would want us to have, it takes a great deal of maturity, and you have to work on that continually throughout your life. And so I really think that one of the main problems is just a lack 
of maturity. You know, when you're young and you get married, it's very, very exciting, and you look forward to your wedding day, and you see your life stretching out in front of you, and then what happens is the reality of life sets in after the wedding ceremony. And if you don't develop in your maturity, then that lack of maturity can certainly contribute to a failed marriage. And so let's just read with those thoughts in mind, verses 21, and we'll come on down then to about verse 29. So beginning in verse 21, it talks about the importance of submitting to one another in the fear of God, and it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands, as to the Lord. And you can see that that's a very respectful, loving kind of submission. It's not cowering in fear or something like that, but rather there is a respect and a reverence there that is due. And so just keep that in mind as we continue through the verses. And then continuing on in verse 23, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, And he is the savior of the body. You know, everybody is under somebody. Now, isn't that right? And in the scheme of things, uh, Christ the Son, in, in the scheme of redemption, was under God the Father. But then, men, we're under God. We're under Christ. Women are under men. We see that. But everybody is under somebody. And it takes a great deal of humility and maturity to understand just what that means and to handle that in the right way. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And now here comes the hard part, men. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And would you all agree with me that that would be a very sacrificial kind of love? where you consider what is best for the other person. You have their needs and their thoughts uppermost in your mind. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. Now, you know, immaturity says, I'm going to think of myself before I think of anybody else. You know, my needs and what I want and what's most important to me, that's selfishness. That, that's immaturity talking. But these verses are talking about a mature relationship where you consider the needs of the other person even before your own needs. Now, you know, that's easy for Brother Evans to stand up here and talk about. It's hard to do that in day-to-day life. You know, that's the challenge of day-to-day living. It says in verse 29, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. I guess what I'm saying is marriage is for adults and not, for emotional children. If I understand these verses at all, that's one point that really jumps out at me. And marriage is not a plaything uh, just to be cast aside whenever boredom sets in. It's not just some toy that whenever you get tired of it, you know, you throw it in the closet and you get rid of it. It requires maturity to be married. And marriage is real It's not living in a dream world. And, you know, we always have this idea of marriage with the white picket fence and that sort of thing, and everything's going to be smooth and easy. And you know that part where the preacher says, you know, in sickness and in health, and usually they say things like, for better and for worse. We we never think that it actually is going to be for the worse or that there's going to be something hard or difficult that we have to deal with. And friends, that's where maturity comes in. Selfishness is immaturity. And so what I'm saying is, if you want to have a successful marriage, first thing we have to do is we have to grow up and consider others. So just a lack of maturity causes many marriages, I think, to flounder. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, women. 
who may have, or girls, a pampered princess attitude whenever they get into marriage. Now, friends, that is not going to work, and that's not going to work any better than a man having a spoiled prince attitude. Those things just won't work for a marriage. So just a lack of maturity, I think, is where many marriages run into difficulty. And I would just say it it might be as simple as remembering that old golden rule and treat other people, especially your spouse, in the way that you would like to be treated. And remember that other people need food and they need clothing and they need furniture and they need cars and there's work that has to be done around the house and you have to help one another and in recreation... There's give and there's take. You have to let the other person enjoy some of the things that they enjoy doing. All of that speaks to this point of maturity. And as I said, it's easy to talk about those things. And I think everybody here would say, yes, that is important, but I believe it's a challenge in day-to-day life. Now, the next point I want to talk to you about, and I was trying to figure out a nice, polite way to say this, and there just didn't. I'm just going to have to say it as plainly as I can. In my experience, marriages that immediately run into problems is when the wife and the husband, wife or the husband, have, do I have your attention? Wandering eyes. And that is, they never really have committed to the idea that I am giving myself to this other person and I am not going to allow anybody else under any circumstances to come between me and my spouse. And I'm not going to give in to the temptation to have wandering eyes. And I told Robin when I were coming over this evening, I'll just tell you all one point that I think I've seen in the last generation of time. Just since I've been preaching, I used to always think about usually when you talk about an unfaithful spouse, I think years ago, generation ago, it was usually or most often the husband who was messing around with an unmarried woman. That was the usual circumstance Now, I don't know if it's the result of women's lib or what cultural forces might be at work, but I can just tell you all that today it's just as common for the married wife to be fooling around with somebody. And really, it comes down to just having wandering eyes. And you remember when you stood up before that preacher and before all those witnesses but most importantly, before the God in heaven, and you promised, you promised to God, and before all those witnesses, and before your spouse, you promised to reserve yourself for that spouse, and remain true to one another, and not to give in to those worldly temptations, And then we find all kinds of reasons. And sometimes folks will say, well, it just happened. It just, it wasn't something I was planning on. And it just happened that I fell in love with this other person. I'm here to tell you, it does not just happen. What does happen is that two people decide to engage in an illicit relationship And I'll tell you how it usually starts. It starts, for example, at work, where you go out and just have an innocent cup of coffee after work, and maybe you say a few things that are just over the line, you know, kind of testing the waters a little bit, and that other person just seems to understand you so much more than your spouse does, and you start kind of flirting around the edges a little bit, And you start making plans to be together. So I can tell you how it happens. That's the way that it happens. It's not some accident. You know, nobody forces you into a relationship with somebody else. Nobody makes you engage in a sinful relationship. It is a decision that folks make. 
And if you want to know, I, I just tell you, if, if the testimony of a gospel preacher is worth anything, I can just tell you right now that usually the reasons why marriages fail. When somebody says to you, if, if a husband or a wife says, well, I just don't love them anymore. Have y'all heard that before? I just don't love them anymore. I just don't love her anymore. Y'all know what that really means? About 99 times out of 100? That usually means because I'm in love with somebody else. That's usually what that means. Now, brothers and sisters, if you want to know the reason why most marriages fail, I'll just tell you right now, it's because of wandering eyes. And you made a promise before God and man that you wouldn't do that. Now, what happens is that our conscience won't allow us to just admit that and say that we've done something wrong. It's very hard for us to admit that to ourselves. So what we've got to try to do is come up with some reason why we just didn't have any other avenue of escape except this relationship with this other person. And so we've got to figure out why our spouse is so bad and, and why they behaved so poorly and done so many things that are wrong that we just had to engage in this other relationship. Now, brothers and sisters, all that is is wandering eyes. And that's the reason why most marriages, frankly, in my experience, end up failing. Well, just something for you to consider. And how about this one? And this kind of goes along with what we've already said. How about just a failure to understand the commitment that is involved? You know, that's a word that's not very popular, commitment. It's a lifetime commitment. It's a used to be, I don't know if preachers still say this as often or most preachers still say this, but what do they used to say there at the end? Till what? Till when? Till when? Till death do us part. That is a lifetime commitment. As long as we both shall live. Do you all know what's becoming more common in marriage ceremonies now instead of saying, for as long as we both shall live. It's becoming common now for denominational preachers to say, for as long as we both shall love. For as long as we both shall love. I got news for you. There are going to be days when you're not even very likable, much less lovable. And if you're just going to stay married for as long as you're feeling all lovey-dovey toward one another and everything's going smoothly, I'll guarantee you absolutely are going to have problems. Too many people say, I do, when what they really mean is, I don't. A Times article back in 1971, think about how long ago that was, 1971, stated that in Maryland, two state legislators introduced a bill that called for making marriage a three-year contract with the option to renew every three years by the mutual consent of both parties. You find anything like that in the Bible? That, that sound anything like what God had in mind for marriage from the very beginning? An Associated Press article from Tampa, Florida, years ago said that a Unitarian minister who calls traditional marriage archaic is offering a one-year spiritually sanctioned trial marriage to couples who vow to love, honor, and practice contraception. I'm trying to wrap my mind around all that. The Reverend Adrian Mellot, 25 years old, that's about right, said that he believes that after a spiritually sanctioned year of living together, and you know he'd be the authority on all this, a sanctioned year of living together, the partners can better decide their future relationship, if any, and a marriage license is not required in his world. Now friends, you know what all that is? All that fancy talk I just said? That's a failure to understand commitment. That, that is a failure to make a commitment. If you want to know why marriages oftentimes fail, it's because people don't understand the nature, oftentimes, of the lifetime commitment. Third point I'm going to ask you to think about, and I guess we're all guilty of this a little bit, unfair a harsh criticism of our spouse. Unfair or harsh criticism. Do you remember when you were dating how nice you were to one another? 
We had those dating manners and you open the door for one another and you're walking along in the street and Robin stumbles and I say, careful, sweet, you know, and you kind of go on the way. And then you're married for a few years and Robin stumbles and I say, pick up your big feet or something like that. That's a terrible thing. Now, does that happen? Where husbands and wives start picking on one another or criticizing one another behind the scenes or saying bad things about one another all the time. You criticize the partner before others. I was thinking about, if you want to put a Bible passage with this, I was thinking about the instruction in 1 Peter 4 and verse 8. 1 Peter 4 and verse 8 says, And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Now, That's not speaking especially to the marriage relationship, but it certainly would include the marriage relationship to have fervent love for one another, to consider one another, try to help one another the best that you can. You know, criticism should be constructive, done in private with love. You know, a good rule of thumb, a good rule of thumb is to commend in public and to criticize in private. And if y'all want to know a marriage that's in trouble, you just show me a marriage where the husband or the wife start criticizing one another in the company of other people. Uh, That marriage is headed for some rocky shoals. And then I'll just say this. How, How about this? How about a distrust or a lack of confidence in one another? Uh, Sometimes we behave in a way uh, that the spouse can't have confidence in us, or else we just choose not to have confidence in our spouse. And I was thinking about the verses that we studied this morning when we studied Proverbs chapter 31 and the godly woman. What did it say there in Proverbs 31? If you come down to about verse 11, it says, The heart of her husband safely trust her so he will have No lack of gain. Having trust and confidence in your spouse. That that is the nature of love. Uh, Fellas, she married you, didn't she? How about having a little confidence and a little trust in your wife? And then going along with that, I would say this. How about just sometimes we have a failure to show kindness and courtesy and thoughtfulness to our spouses. Uh, We're told, be not bitter against them. Notice Colossians 3.19, it says, Colossians 3.19, Husbands, love your wives, and do not be bitter toward them. What's that song, what's that song say? Try a little tenderness? How about that, fellas? How about trying a little tenderness? And constant nagging. Y'all hear this, and by the way, I guess we usually think about the wife constantly nagging the husband. I'll just tell you that the husbands can be just as guilty of nagging as the wives can be. Constant nagging has no place in the marriage relationship. If the front steps need fixing, tell the husband that, but not every few minutes of every day. That's not going to help the marriage relationship. And fellas, if she burns the bread, tell her, but don't tell her every morning for four months. Are you going to be in trouble? And it just seems to me that sometimes we lose the art of compliments and appreciation. You know, everybody needs compliments and appreciation. You know, if compliments can add happiness when we're dating, and we know that when you compliment somebody, you can just see them beam. You can see the smile. You can see them blossom in front of you whenever you pay somebody a sincere compliment. I'm not talking about just making something up and saying nice things just to sound nice. I'm talking about a genuine compliment. When you pay a genuine compliment to somebody, whether it's a spouse or a child or an older person, you can just see that person blossom in front of you. But I think what happens is, if we're not careful after a few years, we forget about that. And we think that's just for when you're dating. And we forget about those things are just as important when you're married to one another. You ever compliment your wife on her cooking? 
You ever do that or just tell her whenever you think she's messed up on something? How about the dress? The pretty dress she's wearing. Or how about the fact that she takes time to fix your hair? Or how about the fact that she takes the time to be good in her housekeeping? And how about opening the door for her? Just those, those small kindnesses that we used to show to one another. Don't starve somebody for appreciation. Fellas, if you don't hear anything else in this sermon this evening, y'all hear this. If you don't show appreciation for your wife, if you've just given that up and thought that's just dating manners and you don't do that once you've been married, what do y'all think is going to happen when somebody comes along and does show appreciation for your wife? And she's starving for appreciation. Have you ever thought about that? So make certain that you don't fail. Make sure that you show kindness and courtesy and thoughtfulness. How long has it been since you told your wife that you love her? This is, uh, uh, this is Valentine's. We just finished up with Valentine's Day. Just thinking about that. I was in the barber shop the other day, and I was asking my barber, I said, you, you get something for your wife? He said, no. He said, I told her we got too many bills to pay, and, this, and he was being serious. I thought he was being flippant with me. But he was being serious. He said, I just told her we, we got too many bills to pay, and this isn't the year, and just not going to get her anything for Valentine's Day. I thought, boy, there's you a strong marriage. I bet she's going to appreciate that. How about showing kindness and courtesy and appreciation for your spouse? And doesn't that work both ways? Doesn't that work for both the husband and the wife? How long? Somebody says, well, I married her and I told her I loved her when I married her. And if that ever changes, I'll let her know that it's changed. No, no. How about daily? How about the fact that God gave you a wife for another day? How about somebody who loves you and puts up with you even with all of your faults and your weaknesses? You want to see a marriage that's headed for problems, headed for trouble, just show me a marriage where there's no appreciation, there's no kindness, there's no consideration that's being shown. And then how about this? How about husbands who simply fail to act as the heads of their family. You know, we started out this evening by reading in Ephesians 5, and I know some situations where the husband refuses, refuses to be the head of the family, and the ship is sinking because he's not being the head of the family, and the wife is doing what she can to try to keep the ship floating, and he gets upset. He gets mad at her. Well, friends, why did she do that? Because you weren't fulfilling the role that God gave to you. And fellas, may I tell you this? And uh, ladies, just take it for what it's worth. How about <clears throat> do you have a husband? Or are you dating a young man who's shown that he has a good work ethic and is willing and able to to support the family. Now we have all kinds of reasons why we can't do that or why we won't do that. that. That's part of that, having consideration for the other person. That's part of that spoiled prince attitude that we talked about. Husbands, do we have the attitude where we're really willing to work? Well, I just haven't found the job that suits me yet. Well, how about working a job until you find the job that suits you? How about that? And sometimes the wife is forced to do things that she ought to not be forced to do simply because the husband's not willing to fulfill the role that God gave to him. And again, Ephesians 5 is really the verse that speaks to that. May I tell you the other big one? I would be wrong if I didn't mention this. I, I talked about the fact that wandering eyes are probably the number one reason why marriages fail. But may I tell you all the second reason, the second big reason, I think? And that is simply a failure to give up a pet sin. A failure to truly repent of a pet sin. I don't know what the sin might be. It might be something like pornography. It might be something like drugs, alcohol. You just think of the sin. 
But friends, if we don't sweep out the corners of our life and get rid of those pet sins that separate us from God and that drive a wedge in our marriages, we shouldn't be surprised if we have problems. Romans 13 and verse 14 talks about getting rid of the sin in our lives. All of the sin in our lives. I wonder how many... What would a guess be? I wonder how many marriages have been destroyed by alcoholism here in America today. What do you all think? How many because of drugs? How many because of the unfaithfulness through pornography? How, how often has that happened? Whatever the pet sin might be, when we refuse to give up that pet sin, we're inviting problems into our marriage. And then finally, I'm going to give you just one last point this evening. How about not being united in Christ? I am always, always going to encourage young men and women to marry somebody who wants to go to heaven even more than they do. And I'm here to tell you that marriage is hard enough. This whole life is hard enough, isn't it? When you're both pulling in the same direction. It's going to be tough if you're both pulling in the same direction. If you have the same values, it's going to be tough. Life's going to be hard. It's going to throw some some stumbling blocks in your way. But you need to have somebody who's pulling in the same direction that you are. So I'm always going to encourage folks to do that. I want to close by rereading, if I may, please, the verses that Peyton had for us over in 1 Peter chapter 3. Listen to it, please. 1 Peter chapter 3, and beginning in verse 1, Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even as some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. It may be that a wife is married to a man who is not a Christian. Maybe he's left the faith. Maybe he's never been a Christian. And yet, by the good example she sets, she may be able to win him to Christ. That's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And may I make one last closing point? Can I tell you all who I really worry about when we talk about failed marriages? I mean, it's it's devastating. It's hard on husbands and wives. But may I tell you who we forget about a lot of times? I'm thinking about these young folks that we see right down front here today. And I want you to think about the devastating impact that a failed marriage has on the children who may be involved in that marriage. Let's see if we can't learn the lessons that God has left for us and build stronger marriages going forward. John's picked out an invitation song for us this evening. And if we can be of service to you tonight, if you're ready and willing to repent of your sins and confess Jesus, become a disciple of Christ, serve Him faithfully, you can make that choice, you can make that decision this evening, and we invite you to do so while together we stand and sing.